Okay, hello, and welcome to eSchool News webinar. My name is Kevin Hogan. I'm editor-at-large at eSchool News, and I'm happy that you're with us today. With me today are our two gentlemen who are EdTech veterans uh, who can help discuss this important topic. First, let me introduce Greg Kovitz. Greg is the global sales leader for the education vertical at Aquatel Lucent Enterprise, who are the sponsors of this webinar. Prior to assuming this role, Greg had led the North American Education Vertical. During this time, Greg has overseen or created several vertical-focused solutions, including the Fundamentals of Communications, which is a vendor-neutral course on digital network communications, Safe Campus, which is a solution uniting emergency alerts with first responder collaboration and mass notification, Secure Campus, which is a solution that allows instructors to limit student network access to determined sites, and pandemic education con continuity, a solution that enables classroom instruction in the event that an institution is closed due to health or environmental crisis, which uh, unfortunately we all know too well these days. Also with me today is Aaron Cole. Aaron has 20 years uh, experience with the telecommunications industry, working alongside carrier, enterprise, and cloud customers. The majority of his career has been with Alcatel Lucent or one of its premium partners in locations such as Australia, Belgium, and the US, and undertakes a variety of roles from engineering to consultancy uh, through to business development. So I'm looking forward to this conversation, gentlemen. I think uh, you have a lot of experience that can help our audience uh, come to deal with the issues about recreating the classroom, which uh, unfortunately, we need to do today more than ever. Uh, just talking about these sort of technologies uh, in years past, it was always kind of just kind of a theoretical situation, right? That we have these technologies, they're important, they can improve the way we teach and learn. Uh, more innovative districts, the tech directors would go to their, uh, their, their school boards and say, you know, we really need to set up distance learning. We need to set up remote learning for, for one reason or another. And people would say, too expensive. Why do we need it? This is the way we've done things uh, anyway. I refer to those times as BP before the pandemic, right? Uh, March, March 13th comes around. We're in a brand new world. Maybe we can start off by each of you talking about uh, how your experiences in this industry changed during that month and uh, talk a little bit about how much more important this topic that we're going to dig in deeper to uh, is for, for everyone. Uh, but Greg, we'll start with you. Oh, well, thanks, Kevin. And uh, again, everyone, thank you very much for attending today. Um, you know, it's true. It turned everybody on its ear. Nobody really thought of this. And as you mentioned before, especially in the K through 12 segment of education, they were not prepared or fully prepared to be able to serve their students the way that they had in, in the past. And there was a lot of, uh, of uh, you know, of, of really trying out new things on the fly. And I have to say that it's a credit to our educators that that the students were able to make this pivot and have at least a semblance of of a, of a of a school year. Uh, it was um, it was truly as you mentioned it was unprecedented. Um, some of the tools though that were being used uh, did not really fit into what a normal teacher does every day or how a student would like to uh, interact, and that became problematic. And we started to see. Um, all sorts of challenges, which is the reason for our, our, uh, our call today. But, you know, for me, that's what I saw. And I, I think that, um, you know, Aaron, I, I think you've also had some experiences here with uh, some of your neighbors, as well as your wife and yourself with, uh, with, this, with this switch. Absolutely. It's been, a, um, it's, it's been a sprint for the last six to nine months, right? So um, I think Kevin touched on a very good point. It's, it's been a, a topic that 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 we in the technology or the video collaboration type industry have been have been trying to seed the concept with a lot of school districts for for a significant amount of time, but there really has been uh, very little traction. Um, I also think that we've we've kind of been been road tested over the last uh, six to nine months as well. To your point, there's been an incredible amount of of 
agility and innovation coming out of our, our schools as they as they're dealing with with I guess solutions or 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 capability sets that that really weren't were not up to scratch for for what we've just gone through. Um, what we're what we are seeing, Greg, you and I, on almost on a daily basis as we as we talk with our customers, as we're talking with these with these educators, is is frankly, it's incredibly impressive what they've been able to deliver with the tools at hand. Um, it kind of it's on us now to to make sure that as we move forward, this this is no longer, you know, the the weight is not on their shoulders. The weight is is borne by us to give them tools and techniques to uh, to kind of make this the norm. Let the teachers teach. Let the teachers teach. Give them. Yeah. The yeah. So, uh, I, and we, yeah, I mean, we, it's, it, it's something that I, I, I've described as this has been the greatest beta test in history, right? <laughs> I mean, this Absolutely. has just been forced on, I mean, not only the students, but the teachers uh, as a parent of three who are Zooming right now in other rooms in my house. <laughs> I, I am now a teacher assistant uh, as well as IT support. Um, these technologies have been here uh, and now there's been an acceleration of use. And I think the five um, techniques that, that we're going to dig into deeper here um, really will be able to resonate with folks and, and push it out to the future. Let me ask you this question before we kind of really get into the nitty gritty. Uh, from your experiences, <clears throat> which of these t uh, technologies do you think should remain in place and which should be changed or removed when, when all the madness is over? Greg, any <laughs> thoughts? Wow, that's a, that's a really, you know, I'll tell you what, you can put, get five people in a room and you're going to have five different answers on that. And I think it all goes back to what is the comfort of your community and what is the expertise in, your, in the classroom or in the district itself? So what is the appetite for it? Because I think that um, education can fundamentally change. Like many crises, we've been able to look at, at first it's, you know, like Kermit the Frog, ah, and then it's, hey, I was able to do this. I learned from that. And now we have the ability and the confidence to be able to go forward like that. And that's to, to go forward and start doing it. So I would be very surprised if we didn't start seeing more of a, uh, I want to call it a blended classroom, but I think that we can start taking comfort in knowing that there can be a switch. And so that maybe we've seen the end of snow days, you know, if, yeah. you, know, if you will, for those of you that uh, have snow days, uh, like, uh, like I do and like Aaron does, but uh, the, um, uh, but in addition, though, too, there's been some other, the capabilities are now and the, as you mentioned before, the lack of uh, focus or investment in distant, distance learning and remote learning capabilities. Now that they become more, uh, you know, top of mind, you can now start seeing that, hey, I can spice up my classroom by by just even the parents in my of my students and the different jobs that they have and maybe spice change things up and say, okay, we're going to highlight, you know, what does a banker do? What does a mailman do? What does an engineer do? You know, things like that. So lots of, I think that, I think this, as you said, this is a, this is a great beta test. And I, and I think that uh, there's going to be some good things coming out of it. Yeah. And then, Aaron, any thoughts? I, I, I also think if and we're probably going to get into some of these during our technique discussions, right. But um, in some ways we're in a, I hate to say it, but we're almost in a lucky time, right? So we've got access to tools and technologies that allowed us to adapt this year. Um, access to things like video collaboration, you know, even how we're hosting this, this webinar, for example, on these types of tools. Um, having it as accessible on devices that can handle these types of communications um, is only been uh, available to educators recently. Um, at a cost-effective manner. Um, what I saw this year, so coming back to your, to your point, what I saw this year is we're, we're grabbing those tools and we're saying, how do I use those tools as they exist for education? What I think needs to shift or what I think needs to happen is saying, okay, that's great, we've got the tools, but now let's lean in on these tools and instead of just saying the technology is there for technology's sake, let's adapt them now purely for that, that education um, delivery over distance, right? And so let's not stop here. Let's make sure that as we are using tools for, for distance learning, learning management, video collaboration, 
polling, group breakouts, all of these types of topics, let's, let's ensure that the technology is focused not just on can we do it, but actually can we do it in a way that, that's, that's driving the education of those students. And to a degree, leaning in on the school, the, the skills, I should say, that, that teachers have developed through their career. Um, if you think about a teacher, right, they're, they're used to standing in front of their students um, and a lot of their knowledge transfer skills have been developed because they've, they've got that face-to-face -face or that, that in-person um, relationship there with, with, with their students. How do we deliver the tools to the teachers that they can say, you know what, I've got these decades worth of skills. Now I can deliver it through these types of distance platforms as well. Thank you for the segue, Aaron. That's uh, perfect to go into technique number one, which is uh, talking about student engagement. How do we use these tools to engage the students, whether they're in the classroom or in their remote office or sitting in their bedroom, right? Uh, so let's talk about it. Greg, uh, get us into some of the student engagement techniques uh, that you would recommend for the audience. Thanks, Kevin. And, you know, and student engagement is really all about classroom control. Um, if you have a child that is there that wants to learn and is engaged in the, in the content, they're not going to be messing around. Uh, however, uh, you do need to allow the, the class, especially when they first come in, like any teacher will tell you, you know, and settle down class, you know, how many times did you hear that when you were, you know, when you were in school and, and that that's wise blow off the steam, let them, and then be able to exhibit control and then take command as a teacher is, you know, a, as a teacher naturally does when, when, when they are, when they do this. And so in, in many cases, what that is, is defining the classroom, defining the roles, and then using the tools that are there that allow you to be able to um, recreate your physical classroom, you know, such as whiteboards or being able to do question and answer and unmute or enable people to uh, enable people, but enable students to be able to come in and out like that. Uh, to me, I find that uh, it's, it is, uh, it's a, uh, it's incredible when you see all the different ways that teachers teach. And so one size won't fit all, but having the ability to one, be able to make sure you have a classroom that is focused on you and then be able to use the tools to continue that engagement, uh, I think is, super, is, uh, is, is a winning strategy. Yeah, so Greg, you and I have discussed this at length, right? Um, and we're almost needing to teach our teachers to be the gurus of the tools that they use um, in this new environment, right? Mm -hmm. um, they are the gurus inside their classroom. How do they become the gurus in this, in this distance learning or hybrid learning uh, environment? And so as, a, as, as they're delivered um, technology to be able to do these types of distance learning, um, spend the same amount of time inside those tools that you do in setting up your classroom for student engagement. Um, what I've seen uh, in the early days is taking enterprise or taking off the shelf communication tools and saying, all right, let's go and deliver uh, some distance education. What I was refer referring to before is that sometimes that's just not appropriate for engaging the student. Um, giving an enterprise employee the ability to, to share files, full control of their own video, full control, full control over the collaboration experience, that's what enterprises are looking for. As we start delivering these to tools to, 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 to educate us, <laughs> that's not appropriate anymore. And so, you know, as, as you set up a, a collaboration session with your students, turn off features, have the ability to say, you know what, I know there's a certain portion of my class that will behave. And let's be honest, there's probably a certain portion of my class that will not be behaving. You know, tailor the, the online experience or tailor that classroom for, for the personalities that you know that you're, uh, that you're, you're introducing uh, into, into the classroom. Oh, Aaron, you know, you just jogged my memory too. You know, it's about using the tools. It is a, um, it's super important to also track attendance. That is yes. a, um, you know, for teachers, uh, you know, cause you know, teachers, uh, 
you know, if you're not familiar with what a teacher's day is like, it doesn't just start when they arrive at, you know, at the building. Um, and it doesn't end when they walk out of the building. And one aspect of, of this is analyzing, you know, what is my, uh, what is the engagement of uh, the students in here? How many times are they coming in and out? And that's been a big problem, um, especially in the spring, but even continuing now in the fall, as we've been seeing is that students are just not showing up to schools. I think uh, I was reading, I'm in the Chicago area, I was reading in the Chicago Tribune that almost, they, they were saying up to 30% of students are like absent, AWOL, they don't know where they're at. And uh, my wife is a teacher and she was uh, doing e-learning earlier this year. And uh, there was a couple times where, you know, there was one student that just wasn't showing up um, or other students were, you know, hiding underneath their, uh, their covers. And so uh, it's definitely important then to be able to look at, you know, are students struggling to come in and using these tools because there's also broadband issues in the United States and so may not have the adequate technologies to get there. So are they coming in, coming out? These are all things in analytics that need to be also presented to the teacher and to the administration so that they'll be able to nip this in the bud, to be able to get students to, uh, uh, you know, to be able to talk with the parents and to be able to ensure that there's nothing else going on in the, in the home um, so that there is effective learning going on. And definitely when you talk about um, the techniques and expectations, you know, we all talk about having our own Zoom fatigue after having, uh, you know, four or five hours uh, on these sort of conversations. The expectation that uh, youngsters are going to sit in front of a Zoom room from, from 7.45 to 2.18 like they do in person is just not a, a reality, right? So these are the sort of um, things that need to be put into place to kind of lessen that load, break it up maybe a little bit, add in some movie stuff, add in some um, asynchronous stuff, which is technique number two that I think we should, we should dive into. I know back in the spring when I was having conversations for my interviews with uh, school district officials with, with these school news, success was measured by just making that connection, right? Just making sure that they could have a conversation, you know, the, the, those missing students. Over the summer, there was some course design work. Uh, there were some ideas of how to integrate curriculum into this and which started to, I heard more and more about asynchronous learning versus synchronous uh, learning. Greg, maybe you can go a little bit deeper into those uh, distinctions and, and how important that distinction is. Sure. You know, in fact, so and Kevin and like, like Aaron, Aaron and I have been like, you know, twins this, uh, this whole year, we've been working very closely. And one of the things that has come out uh, quite, quite, uh, quite starkly is this uh, difference. Um, you know, many districts out there have choice, you know, hey, parents, do you want to come in to the building? Great. We got a classroom for you with a teacher. Uh, however, if you don't, um, that's fine. We'll, uh, we'll also set up an e-learning teacher like what my wife was doing. The um, families that have one kid that, had to, that wanted to go, let's say the high school kid, the other one was an elementary and wanted to stay home, the wide a variety of experience there. You know, the one that was going in was seeming to think that they had a better uh, teaching experience or learning experience than the student that was at home. And so it's the parity, the equality between asynchronous and synchronous. And so the tools are there to help, um, to, to help teachers to be able to provide that same experience for students that are learning from home. So, and then when we start, when we look at some of these, you know, it's, it's um, you know, recording is one, but also to, you know, when you think about a regular classroom, many times teachers will break students up into groups, you know, or maybe they'll have a student with special needs and need to be able to address or has an IEP that has certain uh, accommodations that need to be there. And so the technologies are there that or should be there to be able to help them adapt and be able to use the same strategies that they've used to engage their students when they were in a physical classroom as they are in a virtual classroom. And that is a way to be able to help with equality, to be able to get this, get a little bit more of a, of a hom homogeneity between the two types of learning, learning uh, modalities. And I think that's just being mindful when you're, when you're building your, uh, your coursework, right? So mm -hmm. not only do you have the challenge of of high flex, not only do you have the ability to 
to be able to engage a, a student face to face, but maybe a student remotely as well. Um, build your build your your engagement around the tools that you have available to you, um, and it may actually be uh, a more powerful set of of um, there may be actually a, a more powerful set of tools available to you than we had before because of this 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 push to go remote. Um, you talked about uniformity, Greg. It's it's almost uniformity and accessibility. So sometimes you have the ability to access real time. Sometimes you just don't. It's it's you're, you're relying on on parent schedules. You're relying on in classroom schedules, and so you actually have a few extra capabilities under your under your belt here that you can be a little bit more engaged, engaged, but also ensure that the right, the right engagement is delivered at the time that's most appropriate to, to the student. You talked about breakout rooms, Greg, and you also t- talked about being joined at the hip to a large degree up until the beginning of this year. Um, a lot of us vendors and providers were, were pushing these collaboration tools to allow enterprises to work at a global or a national level. Um, what it means, though, is those those capabilities are now coming into the schools. Now, on the previous technique, we say you know, tune them for the student, but leverage them as well. You've got the ability to do polling, whiteboarding, breakout rooms. Like, there's a lot of capabilities that are available to you now that that you can leverage for for student engagement, but you can also you can also make available so that when the student's ready they can pull that content down. And I don't know, at, at times, even in a classroom setting, a student isn't ready for the topic that's at hand. Um, knowing that we've got these tools available to us for distance learning, even in class, students are now gonna be able to pull down the content they need at the time they're ready to digest it or re-review. I'm sorry, Greg. I mean, no, like, this I... is a, per- a perfect example of before the pandemic, uh, what we call the flip classroom, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and educators and innovative educators were using this technique. Um, a lot of other educators were like, you know what, this is not something that I really want to be uh, engaged with. Now, all of a sudden, here we are, and we, we've all flipped the classroom, right? Mm-hmm. Sure have. That's so true. I have, a, I, have a, <laughs> I have experience, too, with when we start thinking about this, you, um, you know, trying to make this equality between uh, asynchronous and synchronous. There's also other things that we can do, as, uh, as Aaron was mentioning, with whiteboards and, and breakout rooms, but we can also record all that and have persistent chat and persistent files. So if a teacher is uh, pushing things out in the virtual world, uh, like handouts that they would do in a classroom, and now they're pushing them out into the virtual classroom, that stays in that classroom. So every time that child comes back into that class in the virtual classroom, that should be there. So they can see if they were absent or they uh, had moved from, let's say, being in person and then decided to go, uh, you know, maybe the, maybe the classroom, maybe somebody got sick. Some of these classrooms, especially where I'm at here in Northwest Indiana, um, schools that had previously been in person have exceeded the threshold of, uh, of uh, infection and have closed down. So now going back into the virtual uh, world and could be brand new to these students that otherwise would have been, you know, had been physical, um, to be able to see the history of the class and be able to understand that all the dialogue and conversation that was going on too is also very helpful and helps, again, maintain this equality uh, between asynchronous and synchronous. I think there was a, there was another case that we uh, we were talking to an education district, Greg, very early on, and the idea has always stuck with me. Where when they were thinking about doing the hybrid, so you know half class, half of the students would be in, half the students would be remote. They were even looking at setting up one of our cameras on a desk in the middle of the classroom. So as the teacher is standing up delivering their delivering their content. Um, not only are the, are, the, are the the students in the classroom receiving that education, the webcam is as well. So all the students on, on, on the other side of the webcam felt like they were getting taught to as if they were in the classroom. Um, the interesting thing then was he, they projected all the, the, the remote students up on a board as well. And so the students that were actually in the class then felt they were engaging the students that were out there remote. And it, it created a, a 
a very good little student community so that no one felt like they were left out from that education session. That's real Star Trek stuff, right? <laughs> As, as, as we said at the beginning of, the, uh, of, of, of this webinar, it's, it's some of these teachers have got very creative with the tools that they have at hand. Yeah, yeah. Well, that leads into uh, to technique number three. I think we should dive in. Uh, let's go a little bit deeper when we talk about collaboration uh, and enabling uh, Q&A and conversation and, and facilitating group work and, and requests for help. Um, Greg, give us some examples of innovation that you've seen this spring of uh, schools and educators who are really taking that uh, idea of co collaboration to the next level. Well, you know, Kevin, this is, and Aaron just hit upon that. I think it's so important for the students to feel that the classroom is their community. And truly, that's what you get. I mean, I used to look forward to going to school because a couple of times I had some really great teachers, uh, but more often it was because I wanted to see my friends or, uh, and, and as I got older, my girlfriend. But anyway, the, uh, but, but honestly, this is all about this uh, third like technique is what we call it collaboration. And it's all about providing that same classroom uh, community, if you will, to be available for students for Q&A to be able to, you know, uh, break out or be able to um, help students with special needs and to ensure that there is this um, continuity of their education, of their learning during these times and that it's not fallen off to the side. So, and that, and that th fortunately, the tools that we've all pivoted to contain uh, pieces or portions of, of this ability to be able to have these types of conversations and um, to be able to create this type of classroom community. Um, and, and we mentioned breakout groups and you know one-to-one -one and, 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 and answering questions, but it really is the way to allow students, and that's just the teacher, the adult to the, to the, to the student, um, but there's also then the dynamic of students being able to chat and being able to communicate with each other. And as you mentioned before, with Zoom fatigue, um, you know, you just, you can't do it for six hours. You, you know, um, very best practices are breaking it up just as you do in a class and allowing students, you know, giving them 30 minutes or so to work on the, on the sheet. And then, or to work in a group together while the teacher, you know, virtually walks around and monitors them just as they would in a classroom. Greg, you, you told me about a very kind of interesting topic a couple of days ago, um, again, on, a, on another call with, a, with another customer of ours, where the teacher is more than an educator. The teacher is, is, is a life presence for some of these students, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's, there's, there's this engagement or there's this relationship that builds between students and, and, and teachers through the year that, that just is, is fundamental to the, uh, to, to the development or the security or the, the safety of these, these children. Um, interestingly, you may actually be more present with the tools that are at hand at the moment, right? So we put up here, you know, be available, one-to-one -one consultation. It almost feels like we're, we're taking... We're taking the, the best practices of a university and pulling that now down into, into K through 12, right? And so it's now, if, if, again, if you're, if you're the guru of your tools, right, it's now easier to be engaged with a student in a setting that the student will, will flourish. If that is a one-to-one -one session, you now have the ability to do that a lot easier than if you're sitting at the front of the class. If it is a breakout session, you can set up a little cohort of students, right? And and you can you can you can pick and choose the students that just bring out the best of each other. And again, these tools now allow you to do that as well. Um, there's, there's I, I I almost get the sense that the ability to engage at the right time with the right mechanism is is easier to do now because we we as as technology providers are are being forced to sprint and deliver tools that, that allow that to happen. <clears throat> yeah, in, in my conversations, uh, again, the, the idea of social emotional learning was something that was top of mind for, for most educators before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. It became the most important thing this yep. spring. It wasn't about assessment scores. It was about, are you safe? Are you well? Mm -hmm. How do you feel? Mm -hmm. And what 
tech directors and educators have been telling me there's a strange intimacy that occurs using Zoom. Uh, there's a power dynamic that changes when you're talking between a student and a teacher about social, emotional sort of things. So, you know, if you're sent to the principal's office in real life <laughs> because you're having a problem in your class, that's a weird dynamic. Um, when you do it on Zoom, it's a little bit more egalitarian somehow, and people are more likely to talk. I'll say as a parent, I have had my most effective um, parent-teacher conferences. I've had my most effective back-to-school night than I have had in the 16 years that I'm doing them, uh, just because I'm not in the back row <laughs> like I was as a student, sitting in a small desk, waiting for this thing to be over, right? I mean, it, so are we just, are these things that are being discovered or these things that you guys knew all along and, and have just been waiting oh, for this moment? That's an interesting point, right? So again, I, I kind of, I, I'm talking about the pivoting of enterprise tools into education, right? And we, we've known for a while on the, on the enterprise side that there is, there is this quicker path to transparency or there's, there's this quicker path to an open discussion that you'll have um, over a video call. So um, it's really tough to build the trust. If, you, if you're talking about a relationship, right? You know, the, the beginning is, 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 is trust phase. And then very quickly, are you transparent and open so that you can get good knowledge transfer? On the education side, that trust is almost implied with the, with the, the concept of a, a teacher and a student. So that concept of transparency um, We've heard this quite a lot. It's, it's interesting that you that you bring this up, but we've heard that quite a lot over the last couple of months. Where, where, um, you you are a lot more open when there's this this window pane, or there's this ability to to close the camera, or there's this this feeling of a bit of distance, so you're not in that personal space. And so what we're seeing is, ironically, because of that distance, there is a lot more of an intimate discussion happening. Yeah, Greg, any, any thoughts on that? Uh, I, it's a, I always love listening to Aaron because he has such interesting insights to this. But it's, uh, you know, to me, I, I, I think that uh, we are, you know, this goes back to what you had asked before. Is education going to go back to normal? Is it going to go back to what we thought was normal prior to March 13th? And I think that just, you know, through this whole, you know, what we've just been exploring, Absolutely. It'll go back to normal with physical, but we'll also get the benefits of what we've been learning and being able to utilize here and the intimacy that, that this creates. I think it's only going to even get better with the tools that we're bringing online, with, uh, with, uh, with the evolution of uh, teaching and pedagogy for this, for this moment. I think that this is, uh, this is something that could be a very good something for everybody to have in their toolkit. Well, I certainly don't ever want to go back to having in-person parent-teacher conferences. <laughs> this is the way to do it. <laughs> Give me 20 minutes. I can turn it off and uh, I don't have to get in the car to do it. Which kind of brings us to... Uh, oh, go ahead, Aaron. No, I was going to say, it may bring us to our next technique. Exactly right. Another segue <laughs> into, the, uh, into the, the techniques of parent communications. Uh, I think we all know as, as parents ourselves, we were all kind of thrown into the... Uh, into the deep end uh, in, in March uh, when it came to all of a sudden being teaching assistance and, and, and IT support. Um, let's talk a little bit about how that dynamic, once again, has been completely changed now. Uh, I myself have spent more time in the past seven months involved in my children's education than I've had in, in, in 16 years. And it's because of these technologies and the technologies that, that you folks provide that have enabled that to occur. Um, let's get into it. Uh, so is the parent forever now the new official teaching assistant? <laughs> well, I have to say, uh, given my experience when, uh, my, my, again, my wife's a teacher and uh, my children had the benefit of uh, being in her class so that meant that the homework duties fell on me in the evening and <laughs> I never want to go back to that. And so that's why during this pandemic, it's super important that the parent teacher communication lines are open and healthy uh, because like you were saying, like, like you were just mentioning, you have now, you know, you're the unsung, the parents are the unsung heroes of this uh, pivot to remote learning. 
Um, I, I mentioned before, teachers are absolutely, but the parents are the ones that really, you know, have to be engaged, you know, as you're going through those attendance, you know, reports, or you're looking at the activity and the participation of a student, the only person that really can affect that is going to be the parent. And that is where the teachers and administration be, need to be able to have these communication channels open. So to, to leverage, again, these same tools, video conferencing, the ability to chat, the ability to, to file share to work with them, um, to help even teach them the topic that they're going to have to then work with on their, with their students, with their children um, when they're doing their homework. I mean, there's many, many times to do that. And there's another dimension, too, that when we talk about parent-teacher communications is that many districts had did this pivot um, and teachers were actually not even coming into the buildings. They were doing this from their, their home. And when they wanted to then, when they needed to talk to a parent, they would then use their home phone number or their home or their personal cell phone, which, you know, I normally don't, I don't, I use that all the time myself. However, in the role that a teacher has in, in, in community and society, many times they want to, you know, protect their privacy and protect their identity. And that's not available doing, working like that. But there are tools like we can provide that would allow you to enter, you know, to connect your environment to your uh, district's, you know, phone system, so that you are presented as if you're calling from your uh, from your home. But the, but the, these are, but I'm kind of going into more technical things. But it's super important to be able to communicate and have regular communications with with parents and let them know um, that you're there and available to them. Again, back one last thing. Back with my uh, wife. You know, her school day, um, she would leave here about 7.30 in the morning, 15-minute uh, ride, and then she'd come home around 5.30. She would not be fully done with her day until probably about 7.30, answering emails or getting on the phone and, and talking to parents. So, again, this communication channel is absolutely imperative for student success. So, this has been one of those those, I guess, tough balances that we've seen. Um, one thing that I did not expect is as we started to, to roll out these collaboration applications for, for school districts is this need for, it's almost a structured, a structured engagement with, with parents. Um, you made an interesting point before where you're essentially a teaching assistant as a parent, right? Mm -hmm. And so there is this need to, to bring your cohort of parents along educate them just as much as you're educating your students. So there's this need to open up, open up the communication channels to parents. And you've probably talked more with your, your child's parent in the last six months than you probably would have had combined over the last two to three years, right? So you're building this relationship with, with teachers, but it needs to be structured. So on, on the teacher's perspective, this is, this is their career. This is their workplace. So how do you, how do you facilitate this, this increased need to collaborate and communicate with your teaching assistant parent cohorts in a, in a manner that, that respects their boundaries and their structure, right? And so we've been, we've been pressed by, by school districts to say, can you give me the tools for my teachers to make it as seamless as possible as to whether they're in the classroom or they're at home to allow parents to communicate, but communicate on, on, you know, a timely structured manner, right? So do you communicate to a teacher via their, their cell phone or do you do it via the front office or a number delivered by the school and that's associated to that teacher? If the teacher happens to be in the classroom and they're teaching, you don't expect to be able to communicate with that teacher, not available. Again, that same type of structure should be available when they're distant as well. Call that same number till it gets delivered to the, to the teacher. If they're in the middle of a classroom, push them off to voicemail. But if they are available, take the call. But vice versa, leave a message. Teacher's going to get back to you. And so how do you create this continuity of, of collaboration between, between teacher and parent, but doing it in a structured manner so the teacher can, can continue to treat this as as you know, their, it's almost their profession is the delivery of education to the students rather than this is becoming their 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. life. 
Well, I mean, this slides into how much different the education dynamic is to so many other different sort of professional uh, industries. Uh, we're not talking about a one to one. We're talking about a one to thirty. I mean, yeah. and that that educator has the responsibility to feel. You know, we, we all talk about personalized learning, right? And how every student deserves to have their own individual experience. But that puts the demand on one teacher in a classroom to to, to, to spread that out. Uh, how can we use these tools to um, foster that dynamic? Um, is it because that we, we're in this synchronous setup that it's easier for a teacher to do 30 one-to-ones much more quickly than they were to do it in person? Um, do you put the parents into breakout rooms into different groups? Uh, talk a little bit about how like you can kind of you know, make a strategy for an educator to use this uh, in order to manage that. You're not just talking about 30 kids. You're talking about two, maybe one or two parents to every kid. So you're, you're talking about 100 a hundred people to, to one, right? Well, I think America recognized the, the value of teachers. If they hadn't before, they certainly have now. I don't think there's one of us that would like to uh, change places with, a, with an educator um, and try to handle a classroom full of, uh, of students. Uh, that's, that's definitely a skill that uh, is not taught. It's something that you have to, you know, your classroom, your classroom presence is something that you have to learn and that's all about experience. But um, yeah, using, it's, it's super imperative to use these tools. And that actually gets us to the, um, I think that the next technique, which is all about using these same tools for um, the community of the district for professional development to not be isolated. You know, I've always uh, felt that teaching is, is really a lonely profession. Sure, you're in a in a room full of other adult, uh, other heartbeats, um, but they're not your your peers. They're not your um, even your your uh, age uh, peers, and uh, and so and and it's a job. You're doing something with them, and so you are really isolated and not working with any other adults uh, throughout your throughout your day. Um, so it it's imperative, especially in times like this, that if something is working good to be able to have some sort of community, some uh, mechanism to be able to share that information with others, either in your department or in your grade level that, wow, just, I just did, I just did our, you know, our Indiana history and, and we, I used this new resource and it was excellent. The kids really liked it. I think you guys should try it as well. And, uh, you know, things like that, that just, you know, kind of get lost because, you know, we're all, everybody's all isolated like that. So that's another, that is the, to me, that's the last technique to be able to have an exemplary remote teaching and learning experience is to have this dimension of being able to have regular professional development, to be able to bring experts into the district, to also be able to take the experts in the district and to be able to share their knowledge outside uh, to their peers in other buildings or in other departments. So coming back to your to your question, right? So how do you how do you bring that structure? How do you give them the tools to handle this one to 30, one to one to 60, one to 90, one to 100 type ratio, right? It's tough. Um, it almost feels like I'm coming back to my example of of learning from from the higher ed space where again you're you're one you're one lecturer to 100, 200, 300 students, how do you make yourself available? And again, it's, it's, it, it comes down to structure. So we talked about office hours, for example, but what does that really mean? How do you reach out to a teacher? As a parent, how do you reach out to a teacher when you need them? Um, and again, we're kind of getting into the technical here, but, but one of the constant requests we've been getting from our school districts is, um, is while video is nice, audio is mandatory, right? So just being able to jump on a phone call mm -hmm. and quickly talk about uh, an issue or a problem or an upcoming assignment, it, it's, it's, it is the, the comfort that, um, that parents are, are expecting or the, the comfortable communication technique that, com that, pe that parents are, are expecting with their teachers. How would you do that during a, a normal education environment? You'd be calling into the front office. You'd be transferred to to the teacher, and you'd leave a voicemail at at at, at that at the teacher's desk, right? Um, what has been pushed on us is to say, 
how do I deliver that call irrespective of where the teacher is? They may be in the classroom. They may be in a home office. They may be in a cafe grabbing in and out, right? Because, because that's the access to technology that that teacher has. Um, make sure that your, your school is delivering you tools that you can take that call wherever you are, but also give the teacher the tools to say, do not disturb. Like we're used to on these, on these, these chat applications, changing your status from available to away to do not disturb to not available. Um, give teachers that, 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 that same capability or those same techniques, right? So um, one of the things that we've, we've done with our school districts recently is given them that technology and we've seen it's almost the IT directors breathe this big sigh of relief where they can say, we've, we've, we've got this capability to, to deliver communications to teachers. We now have also the ability to restrict communication to teachers as well. And, and again, if, you, if you're setting up office hours, then, then you are the master of, of this one to 100 communication, right? Um, again, that's kind of been the, 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 one of the bigger unexpected that, that, that we had through this. We were coming in thinking video, we were coming in thinking chat, document sharing, whiteboarding. We thought that would be the big push. Um, the reality is giving a teacher the tool to call a parent from a number that is representative of the school rather than your personal cell phone, it's been, it's been uh, amazingly well received. Oh, that's great. That's great. And that goes along with, with, with technique number five. I mean, that's just another tool for educators. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit more about uh, kind of teacher to teacher collaboration when it comes to this, this big mess that we're in uh, and, and, and teachers. One, one great thing about education and covering education uh, for me as a journalist is that most other industries, people uh, keep their best secrets to themselves. Uh, in, in education, the, the more you share, the better you look, right? So it, it makes it easy to cover uh, stories, uh, but also it's, it's great for, for that professional development. Greg, maybe we could talk a little bit about that sort of acceleration that you've seen um, through the use of these tools uh, due to the pandemic. Yes, Kevin. You know, in fact, it's it's important. It's it's super important for educators to be able to uh, continue with professional development because there's so many different things, things that they have never um, addressed before in this in this new uh, remote teaching and also hybrid uh, class environment. So it's best to it, the the best practices are to not only have outside experts but also to to be able to tap into the people that are to the expert teachers that are in your district. Um, many districts um, have national board certified teachers um, on their staff. Maybe not in every grade level but, uh, or, or in every building, but um, these master teachers are out there. And, uh, and of course, every classroom teacher has techniques and, and, um, and uh, experiences that have um, been like, oh, this has been excellent. And they talk about it. They, you know, they'll, they'll talk about it in the lounge or they go out to lunch. Um, but now with these tools, we can make that um, easier for them to be able to share their experiences, to be able to give a heads up that, hey, this resource is great. Oh, if you use this resource, you're going to need to have a couple manipulatives for the kids to use and, and da, 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 you know, different things like that. So it's, um, it's absolutely critical um, for all of every, every, every district's goal of every child learning, of every child being engaged, um, it's very important for them to not uh, to ensure that teachers are actually sharing all of the different successes that they have and so that they can be replicated in other classrooms. So it's almost like we're going back to one of our previous techniques, continuity, right? Um, one of the things that we see is it's almost like a bit of a communication overload. So here, here Greg and I are talking about leverage, leverage the technologies that you have available to you, use more of them. Um, the challenge that you have is that um, 
our lives now are kind of dominated with an inflow of information. So it's really tough to, to get your mind out of tactical deal with an incoming communication and out into strategic ongoing, I want to deliver a, a consistent uh, education experience for my students. Um, if it is possible, the tools that you use to engage your students, the tools that you use to engage your parents, can they be the ones that you, you use to engage your colleagues as well? Um, does it mean that you set up your colleague communication in something that looks like a classroom? No. But does it mean you've got to log into a different application? Um, you shouldn't have to. And so if, as, if there is this seamless shift from uh, communicating with, with a student and then you can simply pop out a communication and have that with a cohort of, of teachers saying, guess what I just tried and it was phenomenal, it worked then not only are you improving communications across teachers, you're probably reducing the stress of them running three, four, five different applications or tools mm -hmm. as well. Um, we all, there, there is no doubt we have a limit to how much we can take in at any point in time. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, Alcatel Lucid and, and how your solutions can help enable uh, all these techniques that, that we've been talking about. I mean, let, let's get into some of the specifics on, on the platform, Greg. Well, uh, so Aaron is my expert on the platform. I've just been trying to feed to them, uh, feed to him and, and the team the different requirements that we have. But essentially, we looked at this, uh, again, looking at the challenges that we were hearing um, not only from our customer base, but also what we were reading from, you know, from experts like yourself. And, you know, you know, you heard all about Zoom bombing and about the lack of encryption and privacy, and and it's super important, especially in K through 12, um, where where FERPA and and other in HIPAA even are are absolutely imperative. And it's um, you know for us, we 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 thought well, number one, we need to make sure that. Um, because we are a telecommunications company and we, we, this, is, this is what we do. So we, we saw this and we go, well, one thing is, is that many universities and, and K through 12s uh, have aligned themselves with a learning management platform of some type, um, whether it's a Google, I'm mean, not Google, um, a Moodle, uh, Blackboard, uh, Canvas, um, some, you know, something that allows a repository for students to be, uh, for teachers to be able to work with their students. Well, to be able to integrate these tools into an LMS instead of making the teachers and everybody come to the uh, conferencing tools, bring those conferencing tools and put them inside the learning management platform. So now they're only, they're using the learning management platform that they're familiar with. So it's nothing new there that helps that reduce that learning curve. Secondly, you're enabling all these different tools to help a teacher to one, set the classroom environment. Secondly, be able to have persistent communication so that when a child comes back in, when the student comes back in to that virtual classroom instance, that they'll see all the conversations and files that have been shared and, and, and posted since the day the class started. And so that they can get fully up to speed if it's a child that's transferring in or if it happens to be, again, as I mentioned, where they went from um, a hybrid type and then all of a sudden the physical classroom had to had to uh, close down and then everybody moved to online. Um, another another another, you know, uh, important thing, too, is in something that the tech the technologies that were being used uh, when the pandemic happened, like Zooms and, team and, and Teams and, uh, and others, uh, Google Meet were, um, uh, or Blackboard Connect, was that the attendance piece of it was, was absent. And so, and especially not just, you know, like for my wife and her e-learning, they were using Blackboard Connect and a um, aide would have to come in to the classroom, the empty classroom where she was teaching and take a picture um, at a certain time of, uh, of the roster of all the kids that were logged in um, to be able to have a streamlined report that not only showed you when, you know, what their duration that they were in the class, but, you know, how often did they join and leave? Because that could be another, an, another issue as, we, as we're seeing on the technology side of it. There are a, a, a big demand for hotspots and for the ability to be able to get reasonable to, uh, uh, internet connection into these students, which is what is needed for, for teaching right now for this remote learning. 
Um, and then one la one la last aspect then is is when we when we look at at all of this is to make sure that um, a a teacher can not only set the classroom personality, but also then to be able to adapt it for, um, to be, you know, so let's say students come in, allows the students to be able to chat and talk and maybe even have their video on when they first come in and then be able to give them a chance to be able to then just, you know, okay, all right, class, class is starting, stop all of that. And so that they are there, that they're present and that they're in the class. But then when the teacher wants to do, you know, Q&A and call on a person, be able to be able to, you know, discreetly be able to undo that, or even to be able to ad adapt and address uh, students that have special needs and have, uh, you know, uh, definite accommodations that need to be there. So those were all the parameters that we, that I fed into Aaron. And then, Aaron and his team came up with, I think, this really beautiful solution that we have. And so I think this should be a good segue for Aaron to uh, share with us what, oh, what it is exactly you, that we have. You definitely pushed us hard this year. So, <laughs> uh, so I, I look after the communications and, and cloud communications portfolio here for, uh, for US and Canada. Um, traditionally, what that's me meant is, is delivering deep stack communication tools to very specific verticals that we chase, of which the number one vertical for us for importance is uh, is education. Um, to a degree, up until up until March, we've been delivering communication tools to 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 school districts to enable the running of the school district. Right, so it's 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 providing it to to the administration side, ensuring that you know there is there is safety and security elements, so we can. We can do calls into classrooms, overhead pagings, all, all, all the kind of the traditional stuff you expect from a communications vendor within a school district. Um, on top of our communications portfolio, we've been, we've been nurturing a, a cloud communications, a cloud collaboration platform called, called Rainbow. And to a degree, it, it, it provides this, this hybrid communication capability where you've got the, the communication platform within the school district. You then want you want to kind of extend access. And so you do so now easily through cloud, cloud applications, right? Um, Rainbow is our tool for doing that. And so with a very simple turn on of a service, we were able to give the educators, the kind of the, the operators of, of the school district access to tools to collaborate, um, be available anywhere, anytime, um, do voice and video communications. Um, as of March, uh, Greg's been pulling me and saying, that's really great. You've got all of these tools that allow the operations, efficient operations of, of a school district. How are you going to tailor that now to deliver education? And I think like, like a lot of vendors in our space, we says, all right, here's, here's, here's the ability to do a video call. Um, why not use that for a classroom? So Greg picked me up, sat me in front of a couple of, uh, superintendents and, and, and directors or CIOs of, of, of IT within school districts and said, let's see how that goes. And so very quickly, we learned that um, the needs for, for the educators is very different than the needs for, for the people running the district, right? And so we embarked on a project which we're calling Rainbow Classroom. So Rainbow Classroom takes a lot of those, those tools and techniques that we've developed for normal enterprise communications and says, how do I tailor that to deliver a classroom experience? And we've been talking about some of the techniques here, but to a degree we've learned and, and nurtured those techniques on the back of this journey of building this, this, this immersive classroom experience. Um, you talked about... Um, you know, how do, how do you provide this, this seamless communication between, between teachers? How do you provide this seamless communication between parents and, and with students? And to a degree, we want you to live within the tools that, that you've already been using. So Greg brought up, you know, uh, this topic of the learning management systems, Moodle and Canvas, et cetera. We've embedded the application straight within there. And so the intent isn't that you have your, your learning management system up on, on one side, and then you've got your collaboration app on the other, maybe a phone app sitting there, and then maybe Zoom sitting up here for video. The goal is that you're in there in your classroom management environment anyway. Can you click and use the tools that are appropriate 
for that workflow. So make us embed ourselves, I guess, into the, and I use that term workflow, right? So embed ourselves into the workflow of, of, of the teacher. As they're kicking off a class, make sure that the, the class communication tools have been preset, they've been curated, and so that when you say it's class time, people, then all of those techniques that we mentioned um, in, in, you know, in, in being the master of your own environment, they're already done. It's easy. Now your mind is on the, on, on, the, on, the, on the task of delivering the course. The mind's not on the task of, um, you know, Johnny, are you muted? Have you turned your camera on? <laughs> oh, I need to turn your camera off. You're misbehaving. You know, all of that is, is, is now, that, that's happened, right? And so the, the, the ease of transition for students from, from their home environment into the classroom environment is, 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 is made a lot easier. So Rainbow Classroom was, was our goal for that. Um, we then, again, I, I, we kind of referred in, 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 in one of our techniques about um, being available for, for parents, right? And so the next challenge was, you know, parents aren't always going to jump on a video collaboration call. Sometimes they're going to be driving along. Um, they've got 15 minutes in between, in between calls. They need to talk to a parent. I'm going to, I'm going to call that number. And so, again, before where we used to have a phone sitting on a desk, now can I deliver that call into that same environment, Rainbow Classroom? The answer is yes, we, 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 we scramble to deliver that. And so the intent here is that the teacher lives inside whatever environment that they've curated or is their preference for us, it's, it's, it's the Rainbow Platform. And can you fulfill each of those five techniques without having to leave that platform? Um, for us, the answer is yes. Our commitment to the education community and I guess to a degree, my commitment to Greg here is that we continue to nurture this. We don't think this, this requirement's going away. So we're, we're, we're leaning in on this, on this capability that says having the technology interesting, curating that technology so that it is, it is a natural extension of a teacher's environment, a teacher's skill set. That's, that's where we're taking that, uh, that platform. Aaron, I love the work that you guys have done for this. And I especially, you know, looking at a couple of, of, of what I consider really interesting features. Many times, like let's say for uh, those districts that are using Zoom, the student, it's the responsibility is on the student to join the, the class. With uh, the way that you all uh, took the requirements that I gave you, I thought it was really clever that you, number one, took any onus off the teacher. The, everything is done in the LMS. The LMS communicates uh, to the student and that for the with Rainbow Classroom. And then when the teacher's ready to start the class, the platform calls the student. And so their laptop, their mobile device, their, their tablet, whatever it is that they have the application on or the browser open for, that will be then ringing them. And I thought that was a, that is, um, to me, that's, you know, puts, again, the control back into the teacher's hand. Teacher starts the class, has the, and then before the class even starts, again, while they're setting it up and saying what, you know, what the, the class parameters are, all the different features that are turned on and enabled when students are, you know, what is their right when they walk into the classroom um, as it's, far as the features are concerned. You guys did a great job. It's subtle, but it's, in, it's important, Greg. And again, it's a thank you for your, for your, for your guidance along this journey, but, um, if you, if it's class starts at, at 10 o'clock and you, you're relying on the student to remember that it's 10 o'clock and then they, they're clicking on their link and joining, that's very different than 10 o'clock starts and suddenly the student's application is, is, is ringing them and it's that reminder, oh yeah, I'm, I'm clicking accept, okay, I'm in. Um, the other one that you pushed me on was 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 this nurturing of breakout rooms. So not just the ability to have breakout rooms, but how can a, how can a, a, a teacher um, on the fly set up these little cohorts of students into, into, these little, into these little groups and yet stay present across those as well? Um, again, it's, it, it, it's something that, that at the beginning, let's say March, we just figured if I can have 30 35, 40 odd students in on a, on a video conference, we're good. No, that's not how teaching happens, right? Teaching happens through a lot more personalization. So that's one of the other things that we've kind of brought in over the last couple of months as well. Aaron, you've been a great partner. It's uh, Thanks, thank man. you. 
Well, gentlemen, I knew that the uh, the hardest part of my job would be to finish this conversation. Uh, so many insights and, and so many uh, ideas. I know I'll, I'll speak for the audience. I, I'm inspired by the ideas that were presented here and the glass half full when we're after this pandemic, that these dynamics and these technologies will be in place. And maybe we could have used this this terrible time to really accelerate the way that uh, we teach and learn our kids. So Greg and Aaron, thank you very much for your time and your insights. Uh, well, thank you, Kevin. I really appreciate you guiding us through this journey as well. Kevin, I appreciate the time today. Great. And thanks everyone for watching and listening.